Good afternoon, data nerds, and welcome back to Stanford University. We have the pleasure today of live broadcasting all day on the Cube at the Women in Data Science Worldwide Annual Event. My name's Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be here with our fantastic lineup of guests. Starting off our final afternoon segment today with Kim. Kim is an absolute inspiration. Just talking to you in the last four <laughs> seconds before we were getting set up, I already feel inspired. You are one of the founders of the Stanford Human Trafficking Data Lab. What, tell us about the lab, what yeah. does that mean? Well thank you so much for having, having me and thank you for your interest in the lab. Yeah. Um, we uh, formed the lab for four years, five years ago at this point um, after a pretty inspirational talk here at Stanford in which we connected with um, a really inspirational partner who uh, was really invested in bringing um, evidence-based interventions for human trafficking into um, Brazil's very robust anti-trafficking community. And um, so, you know, we, the, part, the lab grew out of that uh, partnership, and I've, we formed the lab with a couple of PIs here at Stanford and the Center for Human Rights, and uh, it's been a wild ride for the last five years, developing a huge uh, portfolio of projects that we all contribute to, and it's been really exciting and um, such a rewarding experience as uh, an academic to work in this kind of context. Yeah, absolutely. And this this collaboration and partnership spawned from meeting at an event, right? Mm -hmm. just absolutely. Just two minds intersecting, a little bit of kismet synergy, and five years later, you're crushing it. Kismet is just the right word for it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's, so you, you mentioned something in that intro of evidence-based mm. data in, in, in application here and, and anti-trafficking. Slaves are a hard demographic to reach and get mm. data and evidence That's on. Right. That's right. Victims of human trafficking aren't aren't exactly going to pick up the phone when you do a survey. That's right. <laughs> Where are you finding this evidence? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I'll say that um, when I first started working on human trafficking, um, you know, we did not have any data whatsoever. We had like anecdotal data. We had case studies. We had sort of qualitative, ethnographic kinds of work on human trafficking, and it just really wasn't possible to do the kind of um, quantitative work that we're interested in in the lab. And I started working on trafficking in like the late 90s, right? So um, it's been a really long time. But I'll say that, um, that now in the modern data economy, um, we actually are invested in expanding what we think of as trafficking related data, right? So yes, we do want to have those representative surveys. We want to find the hidden populations. We want to find those hard to reach populations. That's critically important. But we also can um, take advantage of the era that we're living in where we have we are like drinking from a fire hose when it comes to data streams yes we are right and a lot of that data that isn't traditionally used to work on intractable issues like trafficking um, I think if you reimagine what that work looks like um, you can actually do quite a lot in this space so thinking about um, you know, yeah. these reams, archives of, um, of like, you know, labor code violations that aren't related to trafficking, but are a strong predictor of who's going to be a trafficker, right? Or satellite imagery, or, um, you know, sort of administrative databases from social safety net programs and things like that. You can bring all of that to bear. And with the technologies that we have available to us now, the AIs and the LLMs, you can take, you know, volumes and volumes of uh, legal reports and you know court records and things like that and then actually transform that into data that's useful for research right so it's an exciting time and we work with an expansive amount of uh, data on the issue of trafficking when it comes to actually finding the hidden populations themselves um, you know and f like identifying people who are in trafficking, that's really difficult. Um, and, it, yeah. and it actually starts with... And dangerous, I would imagine. Um, yeah, well, actually, I mean, trafficking happens everywhere, right? And mm -hmm. so it's not happening in like seedy back alleys and, you know, places, it is for sure, but it's also happening right under our noses. And so um, one of the important um, pieces of work that we're doing is really to under to build an understanding that is evidence that is rooted in data that is rooted in evidence about where exactly that trafficking is happening. So we just finished this huge um, ca uh, household survey, a representative sample survey um, down in Brazil, where we just you know 
use the traditional tools of um, survey analysis to like get a population representative estimate of where is trafficking happening, what does trafficking look like in practice, yeah. right? Um, what like it may be very different from the types of cases that um, police are interested in or police prosecute, right? What does it really look like for people on the ground, um, and and what are their experiences that are relevant? So we just completed that in December, and we're working through all of that data now, and it's really exciting, and it's giving us a a very interesting window into what everyday exploitation looks like and what um, trafficking looks like for people who experience it year on year, trafficked over and over again, um, and oh. sort of, um, yeah. So that's not very uplifting. <laughs> well, <it's> but, not, <laughs> but, but, but the reality is, so I mean, not everything that comes out of our mouth needs to be inspiring and uplifting. What, what, it, what I do notice in the, and the data on the lab site is is the the estimates are between 27 million and 46 million mm -hmm. people worldwide who are held in modern slavery. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a lot of people. No matter how, I mean, that's a tenth of the population of the United States. If yeah. you were to look at that yeah. as a as a as a sample size, and and it's it's not going to be uplifting when we talk about yeah. that and when we talk about combating that. But hopefully, the technology today. Actually, this is a question for you. Is our technology today and data science today making your job easier than it was in the 90s? Absolutely, there's no question about that. And it's making it easier to, um, well, traffickers use this kind of technology as well, but it is making it easier for um, frontline stakeholders, law enforcement, civil society actors, all yeah. those kind of people who are doing the heavy lifting in the field every single day to try to help people. Their job is really hard. They have a lot of cases in their backlog. So we can bring the tools of data science actually to make their lives easier. We like to say that the tools that we build right. at the Trafficking Data Lab are basically like a fancy dishwasher that really just helps them to make their life easier, to help them process through all of their cases in a more efficient way, to target the cases in a, in a better way, yeah. and to really just enhance the the very important work that frontline people are doing. And so I, I do think it is an exciting time um, because we have access to a lot of technologies and tools that just were not available to us before. And so it's, it's totally. it is very exciting time to be working in the space. I love that dishwasher analogy. You know, we talk about data hygiene, but mm -hmm. when you really think about, about that, it, it is accurate though. It, it and, is. And yeah. so let, let's dig in there a little bit more. In terms of the frontline, what sort of data decision making are you in, able to empower through this? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So I'll give you an example, and I, I just uh, spoke about this um, inside the main conference. Um, we have a project that uses satellite imagery to find illegal work sites in the arc of deforestation in Brazil. So part of, the, everybody knows that deforestation is happening, it's environmentally devastating, it's really terrible but they don't know that there are, it is rife with human rights abuses, right? So people yes. who are deforesting um, you know, are not law abiding by nature and um, they don't care about people <laughs> generally, right? right? They're Safe converting this lot. Yeah, and so, um, so there's a ton of human trafficking in that process of converting all this forest and savanna land into agricultural use it's really hard for law enforcement to actually enforce the regulations and the laws because it's so remote. They just cannot find the sites and right. they don't know where to go. And they and don't it find it until it's after the fact. They don't find it until after the fact, right? These sites, I mean, by the time they identify where it's happening, it's moved on six months ago, right? right. And so, um, Fortunately, the Earth is imaged every single day, the entire Earth, right? And so we can take advantage of this um, new source of data, the satellite imagery, and um, and these object detection algorithms that are re that function really, really well yeah. to actually provide a service to um, our frontline partners where we can say, okay, you don't have to spend uh, two months searching for this site that somebody thought might be in this area. We can actually just deploy our model in this area and tell you the coordinates and then you can go there, right? So that's an example of one type yeah. of application of data science that's providing a real value um, to- So much more efficient. It's incredibly efficient. In fact, it's um, we pilot tested it and yeah. the very first um, operation was completed in three days as opposed to the typical like two, three weeks or something like that. We that were talking in order of magnitude. Too, yeah, and in resource-constrained settings, time is money. Everybody in the field is that takes their attention away from other cases. It takes, um, it costs money, right? And all those things are really constrained. So any way that we can uh, help things work in a better way, help yeah. people do their jobs in a better way, um, is what we want to invest in. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a perfect example, and it allows you to have to be able to respond real time. 
Absolutely. By the time you show up in the past, everyone's gone. Yeah. Or whatever in that particular And in a proactive case. way, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to wait for um, somebody who's in a really bad situation to like go get to a church and like ask for some help, right? Right. You can actually intervene in a proactive way and know and have a complete landscape of what's going on in the area. We talk about how to find hard to reach populations. Yeah. How do you find hard to reach um, like encampments, right? It, it's yeah. really hard. So, but if you can use satellite imagery and these really well-performing object detection algorithms to populate the entire state and identify where they all are every single month, that's a tremendous, that's a tremendous advance um, that we're Absolutely. so excited about. See, yeah. it is uplifting. We just have to get to the right <laughs> part of the conversation. Don't worry about that. How does, how do, how do technological advancements like this and the narrative, the storytelling basically that you're mm. able to do with the data like you're talking about, how does that affect policymaking? Mm. Yeah, that's great. So we are fortunate that we have an incredible partnership and we're working in a con context where um, policymakers are very invested in, in creating evidence-based policy and actually bringing data into their workflows, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, um, us in academia, academia and sometimes in tech or whatever, you can like make the most beautiful product, the most beautiful technology, and people then don't use it if they're not invested in it, mm -hmm. right? So we look for partners that are actually truly invested in a meaningful way. And um, and in this case in Brazil, you know, we formed the lab together. And so there is that partnership baked in from the beginning. Yeah. And so um, there is that investment. And then I think you demonstrate, um, you demonstrate the usefulness of this, and then that translates right away to, to better policy. And in fact, our partners start using it, and then everybody else says, hey, what are they doing? Why do they have that tool? How can we get that tool, right? right? And so then you kind of um, start to expand in that way. And um, so I will say that the work that we do in the lab is quite rare in that the academic research and the technological development that we're doing is designed for and has a direct pipeline right to that policy making from the beginning. And we don't do anything unless we do formative work with our partners and know that what we're doing, the research that we're doing is needed and is helpful and will lead to some policy changes, which is quite exciting to be involved in. Yeah, it is really yeah. exciting to be involved in, especially having seen the, the course of time and the way that you have and mm -hmm. what was possible. I'm sure you were you know, yeah. beating an emotional drum and now you have a very, very yeah. clear data-driven uh, argument for a lot Absolutely. of the things that you're advocating for, not that there shouldn't be that in human rights anyway, but we've all <laughs> been alive long enough to know it's not always the case. Yes. Uh, I'm curious, uh, where where do you see, where do you hope we will be in five to 10 years, mm. given the technological order of magnitude shift we're seeing right now? Yeah, that's such a difficult question because I think, um, you know, just the pace of technological development and the pace mm -hmm. of, um, you know, how things are evolving, I think I am actually most excited for the questions I can't even begin to formulate right now, right? So I'm yes, so excited that's a big part of it, yeah. that, big um, you that. know, there are things on the horizon that are beyond my imagination at this point. And so I'm, I, I want to be in a position to like understand those technologies, understand those advancements mm -hmm. and look for ways to inject them into our work and, and, and bring that to people who can really benefit from that. Um, and so I guess in five years, what I would love to see is um, an expansion of our lab, of our work, and um, you know, additional, you know, more collaborations with so many of the incredibly talented women here at oh this gosh, conference. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine bringing all this talent into your? I mean, it's a it's just an, the feeling in this room. I, I wish I could bottle it and share with the folks watching at home. <laughs> it's yeah. so calm. There's no toxic masculinity here. It's very empowering. It's very empowering. Very uplifting. Yep. And not just in a cheesy "Hey girl, you look cute" in the bathroom way, but yeah. in a "We are doing interesting things, and how can we empower each the other?" Creativity to be even more successful. and the exactly. energy is just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's really inspiring. I'm curious, have you noticed or surfaced any trends or patterns in all of your research at the lab that were particularly surprising to you? Yeah, absolutely, we definitely have. I think I mentioned a, a few minutes ago that we um, just completed a large survey uh, in the field, and um, we're comparing the results of that survey to all of the various streams of administrative data that we have been using. So, you know, thinking about using like LLMs to process and digest and like feature extract from big reams of um, court records and, um, and prosecution yeah. records and whatnot. So that part, the administrative data gives us a really great sense of the corpus of cases that are being prosecuted, that are being, that law enforcement is interested in and that they're following up on. Mm -hmm. When you compare that to actually the results of the research 
research that we did on the ground just by asking everyday workers, a random sample of workers, representative of the agricultural workforce. Yeah. What? Tell me about your experiences. Tell me about how you were paid. Tell me about you know how uh, who took your cell phone in the middle of the day or whatever you know things like right. that. What we're getting is a very actually a very different picture of everyday exploitation that people are enduring. Compa that compares very differently to the cases that are the focus of law enforcement and prosecution, right? And so I think that that's You realize that's probably much more systemic than people. Huge, I mean we find, so we use a yeah. definition of trafficking that includes like a, a couple dozen indicators, right? So it's, you yeah. know, it's really hard. You can't go to somebody and say, are you being trafficked, right? right. People don't know what trafficking is, you know? Yeah. And so um, we use an indicator structure where we have to have like a certain threshold, uh, yeah. you know, in order to, for a person to sort of meet that definition, the internationally accepted definition of a trafficked person, right? Um, but what I found is even among the people that didn't meet that definition, that didn't, you know, sort of cross that threshold, just the experience of exploitation that they have. I mean, 95% of the people in our survey experienced at least one indicator of trafficking, even if they did. I mean, that's just incredible to me, just the level of you know, what people are living with. Abuse, um, yeah. to a degree, and the poor behavior that's out, out there, Absolutely. manipulative behavior. And sure I think there's, there's a, a great portion. policy opportunity there to address some of the exploitative practices that can then contribute to trafficking before it becomes trafficking. Yeah. Yes, I love that. I, it, that's one of the great advantages, I think, of AI in general and ML is we may be able to stop things before they start. Yes. And stop the bad things. Absolutely. And is, being able to predict, you know, where a new hotspot is going to emerge. Or, right. you know, if we know about, like, seasonality and we have this long sort of time series of seasonal, like, you know, ob observations, mm -hmm. where do we need to position our resources, right? What do we need to be prepared for in April versus October? Something right. like that. And that's incredibly powerful. That is and powerful. And it gives... Um, the upper hand to regulators who otherwise wouldn't have that advanced sort of predictive ability, right? Yeah. So it's great. Yeah. We've talked a bit about how you and the team and, and, and partners are using tech for good. You also mentioned that some of the nefarious actors here and traffickers are using tech for bad. Mm. How do we as a society ensure that AI is used in an ethical way? Mm. That's another really great question. It's a tricky one. Uh, it's a really tricky one. In fact, we just had a wonderful, um, you know, very high level panel discussion where uh, the entire focus was on ethical AI and how do we make sure that AI is serving the human rights agenda that we want to have. So it actually goes beyond ethics to human rights, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just this obligation to like, you know, protect people and not do any more harm. It's actually an obligation to um, improve people's lives and help people. So how do we make sure that our AI and our, and our um, data science research is actually working to improve people's lives, right? And that is on us, right, yeah. um, as researchers. And it's not easy. There are no best practices out there yet, right? Mm -hmm. This is the Wild West. And so we need to do a very good job of being stewards, first of all, of the data and the tasks that are given to us. Um, and then we always need to be interrogating our work. And um, in our lab, we have a working relationship and a close partnership with survivor advocates. And mm. that's tremendously mm -hmm. important because, uh, you know, I haven't been trafficked, so I don't know, you know, it's not right. part of my experience. And so we bring in survivor advocates to gut check what we're doing and to sort of really give us an, like an independent perspective on whether we're doing enough, right? Are we really- Such a good pulse check there. Are we, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are we, we're auditing our results, okay, but like, are we really seeing the bias that somebody else might see, you yeah. know, and that kind of thing. So. It's really important work to do, um, but it's there's we need best practices. We need protocols. You know, we have plenty of clinical trial protocols for how like pr protect patients. We need those for um, this kind of work in AI when we're working with very vulnerable populations. Um, and right. um, yeah, so uh, it's it's really challenging, but very important, and it's something that we take very seriously in our lab. I can tell even just from talking to you, and, and like you said, it's it's imperative. Otherwise, we just exacerbate the digital divide. That's right. That's right. This is this is our chance to close the chasm, or absolutely alienate people forever. So. Yeah, and I would say even um, <clears throat> more than closing that digital divide, can we use like this AI and this technology to actually help leapfrog? Right. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. We actually can um, use the technology that we have here to actually bypass some of the like bottlenecks and the sort of legacy things that interrupt our work here in absolutely. context that haven't really implemented those yet. And so we can we can definitely. Um, achieve that if we have enough people with that that type of vision. Yeah. yeah. 
no, that's very, very well said. I love the notion of how we could leapfrog that too together. Everyone yes, together at the same absolutely. time too. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be this incremental linear stuff that we get stuck with a lot of the time. Three final questions for you. Mm. You're very inspiring and I, I feel like when, especially when you're young, your heart's so open to things like trafficking mm -hmm. as, as a cause to invest your time in. Hopefully it stays that way throughout the course of your jaded adult life. <laughs> but, but generally speaking, what would be your advice to a young woman or a woman of any age who's mm -hmm. considering a career in, in data science or the world that we live in? Yeah, okay, well that's, um Again, another great question. Uh, and I will say that it didn't take long for me to become <laughs> jaded, especially if you want to become jaded real quick, start working on human trafficking. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Um, I can only imagine, bless you for what you yeah, do, seriously. Yeah, but you know, I the whole think team. that. Um, so I was given some very good advice when I was a young uh, person, or like probably a freshman in college even, um, in that um, you need to follow what your purpose is and your passion, right? Mm -hmm. And then the human rights movement needs advocates in every single sphere, including data science, including AI, right? Um, and so, um, for me, I've always been a quantitative person. I always knew that I was a quantitative right. person, right? It wasn't compatible with doing human rights work at the time, but I followed that that desire. I got, you know, went through the graduate school. I positioned myself to sort of be in that position. And now when it's possible to work on the issues that I really care about, that I have always cared about, it's, it's possible, right? So I would say that um, for young people, you know, you have to know thyself, right? And you have to follow that natural talent and that natural passion, and then look for opportunities to um, express that in your own personal way that is um, uniquely them, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. To thine own self be true. That's very right, well, exactly. Very well exactly. stated. And follow yeah. that passion. I mean, you don't have to know how your passion is going to make you money yet, as long as you keep your passion in front of mind, you'll Absolutely. And going back skills. to what we talked about before, you can't even imagine what's around the future. Exactly. So there you just We're want to take we we opportunities that, and position yourself to take advantage of those opportunities you can't imagine yet. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Final, that's a beautiful answer. Final two questions. What is your advice for the allies in our world looking mm -hmm. to empower the women in data science around their team or just even women in their lives curious about tech? Yeah, so I would say that um, community is so important. We're here at this conference building that yes. community. I had mentors in my life that were really critical to me in my early development and I love having mentor relationships with young people now. That is so important and it's important to have uh, women in community with other women, right? Yes. So if you want to have somebody who understands your perspective and experience experience and um, you know is like a safe sounding board or a safe you know mm -hmm. space for advice and and that kind of thing and so I would say building that community is critical uh, around yourself around others you know in your space and um, and looking for opportunities to kind of create that um, those mentor mentee relationships is 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 what I would recommend yeah Ab absolutely I love that okay last question for you mm. You're obviously very successful. Is there anyone you would like to give a shout out to today on International Women's Day to say thanks? Oh yeah, of course. I would like to say thank you to my partner in crime at the Data Lab, Jessie Brunner. She's the director of research at the uh, Center for Human Rights here, and she has just been such an incredible inspiration, a friend, and um, just a very talented woman who is an inspiration to many people, including me, and uh, does an absolutely Herculean effort to uh, run the research at her center. And so I'll shout her out, shout out my sister and my mother and all the other inspirational women, the mentors that I've had over the years. It's great. It's, you know, it's uh, wonderful to be surrounded by inspirational women like that. I feel that sitting here at the desk today. <laughs> Kim, thank you so much. Thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure and good luck with the rest of your work and your research. Obviously very important. End up lifting as you have an incredible problem that you're trying to solve. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, our pleasure anytime here on theCUBE. And thank all of you for tuning in live to theCUBE's coverage here from Women in Data Science Worldwide Annual Event at Stanford. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech.